Good morning, everyone. My name is David Lepofsky, and I'm chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Thank you all for taking the time and making the effort to come here. Thanks to our volunteers who have helped so effectively to get people from the various doors to this room. I want to introduce some of our support folks. We have Laura and we have Bonnie who are doing sign language. We have Ian who's either in Sudbury or Sault Ste. Marie, but he's connected up by the internet who's doing real-time captioning. the door we have Erlinda Pachoko. Can people, oh, Erlinda, can you wave at the door for 238 and then she's going to go to the door to room 230. She's attendant care. If anybody needs attendant care, Linda, uh, Erlinda is there to help you. We have uh, uh, a great morning ready to go. Let's get started. Just a couple of preliminaries. We have this room, 228, until 11.30, but we're going to wrap up our formal conversation and give you time to chat with each other right at 11, because right at 11, we have to empty out room 230. We have to be out of there at room two, at 11, so people there can come in here to chat, or go in the hall to chat, uh, or, or leave, or whatever you prefer. <laughs> May I also tell you that we have live tweeting going on from this event, and you're welcome to do it too. If you don't know what Twitter is, you should learn. <laughs> but the hashtag to use is hashtag AODA in your tweets, uh, and then we will be, people around the world will be following what we are doing here this morning. 20 years ago tomorrow, an event took place in this building that was completely unplanned and unexpected. It was the birth of a new, unheard of campaign for accessibility legislation, which started out improbably, took on the impossible, and has traveled an extraordinary distance over the last two decades. What we want to do this morning is to review what happened and introduce an honor, introduce to you an honor some of the key public figures outside our movement who made a key difference in us getting here. We are not honoring anyone today, any individual today, who is involved in our grassroots campaign because we honor everyone in our campaign who contributed to our movement. And whether you're a loudmouth, balding, blind lawyer who seems to get quoted in the newspaper, or you're just a mom with a kid with a disability, or a kid with a mom with a disability, or a person with a disability, or a person who cares about people with disabilities, somewhere in this province, who wrote a letter to the editor, or who went to their member of the legislature, or who showed up to events like this, every single one of you is honored because every single one of you helped us make the progress we've had. So let me take you back in time. Let me take you back 20 years ago tomorrow and begin to tell you the story. So it was the last month's of the Bob Ray NDP government, and it requires people to cast their memory back to remember when Bob Ray was NDP, and was Premier of Ontario, but he was, and they were the government. And a small group of people who were completely not organized, who weren't even connected with each other, started thinking, we need new legislation for accessibility in Ontario, because over a decade earlier, in 1982, people with disabilities fought for and won guarantees of equality in our Human Rights Code and in the Canadian Charter of Rights. We've been left out of both and we fought our way in. 
We won good rights, but 10 or 12 years later, we realized that they were not enough. It wasn't that they were weak rights, it's that you had to enforce your human rights by suing one barrier at a time. And most people with disabilities don't have the time, the energy, the resources, uh, and the, uh, the tolerance to do that for every single barrier they face. Believe me, I know. I personally took on one barrier. I took on the Toronto Transit Commission to get them to do something as easy as announcing bus and signals. them to announce subway stops, even though they said within months, and after one embarrassing CBC interview, that they would. <laughs> it took a ruling of the Human Rights Tribunal. The Human Rights Tribunal ordered them to announce all subway stops for the benefit of blind passengers. Now, you might think that if they've got to, if they've got to announce all subway stops for the benefit of blind passengers, they've got to announce all bus stops. <laughs> you might think that. I might think that everybody thought that except the Toronto Transit Commission. <laughs> so I just sue them again. <laughs> People shouldn't have to go through this. So what happened 20 years ago is a small group of people started thinking about this. But we had a hero. We had a hero who's the first person we honor today who made all the difference. You see, there was a gentleman who was a member of the NDP caucus who is here today named Gary Malkowski. <laughs> Gary was not a member of the cabinet. He was a backbench member of the government. And he did something really courageous. He stood up to his own government and he said, if you're not going to introduce the Disabilities Act, I will. Because we needed a new law to get us to full accessibility without us having to sue one barrier at a time. And so in the spring of, two, of 1994, Gary Malkowski introduced into the legislature the first ever proposed Disabilities Act. After a few months, and some backroom uh, pressure, the government agreed that that bill would go for public hearings. And the public hearings began on November 29, 1994. And at those hearings, a number of us showed up. I was one of them. There's maybe a couple of people here in the room who were there too. There were about 20 of us that we recall at least in the audience. And the minister responsible that day got up to make a speech. And we were waiting to hear whether the government was going to support Gary Malkowski's proposed bill. Well, we heard a great speech about a wonderful, what a wonderful guy Gary is. He is the first deaf person to ever be elected in a Western democratic legislature anywhere. And he made real history. So we were impressed. And we heard how impressive he was from the minister's speech. We heard what wonderful things the government had done for people with disabilities. A speech, by the way, we heard from minister after minister, government after government, and frankly, it's usually about the same speech. <laughs> but nothing about the bill. We were fed up. Our blood was boiling. After the meeting left, we walked out of that room, and we weren't an organized group. And word reached us that Gary had found a room. Gary said, uh, recently told me it was the government caucus room. We wanted to hold this meeting there today, but it's too small. <laughs> we got in that meeting room. Gary got up in front of us and said, we need a new coalition. We need a coalition to fight for a disabilities act. And that's when and how it all got started. We are indebted to Gary Malkowski because normally a coalition creates a bill. In this case, Gary's bill created a coalition. And it's that coalition, which was first called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee, that got us started. Let me begin by calling up and honoring Gary. I want to tell you that before Gary comes up that we are going to give an award 
to each of the people we honor, but it's a real grassroots award. We don't give out plaques, though they're important. We don't give out medals, though they're wonderful. We give out a baseball cap. <laughs> but we give out a special baseball cap, because it has three words in Braille. And the three words in Braille are one that each of the people we honor today deserve to wear proudly. Because the three words in Braille, trust me, I read it, says the, the three words are, make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Malkowski. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> 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 as we stand in these hollowed halls, 
where of course truth always prevails. <laughs> and Gary, you don't look a day older than you did 20 years ago. <laughs> so when we started 20 years ago, we took on something that looked practically, realistically absurd and impossible. To unite the disability community that had never heard of a Disabilities Act before, to get political parties on side, to get uh, the government uh, to listen to us, to get the media to cover an issue when they're swapped with others. It was so uphill that it was utterly ridiculous. But we carried on. One of the people we want to honor today was, as Gary mentioned, Rosario Marquesa. Rosario was the chair of the standing committee that held hearings that famous day and over the next couple of weeks before the legislature rose. And he heard what we were saying, and over the next years up until the termination of his time in this building earlier this year, he raised our issues time and again. And having MPPs of all parties who could be counted on to raise our issues were critical to any success that we have achieved. I want to call up Rosario. By the way, I've told all of our honorees that they each get two minutes and have a lawyer tell politicians they only get two minutes. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks very much, David. It's true about uh, the two minutes. Uh, often in the legislature, one needs at least 20 minutes to, to begin the speech, and so two minutes is, is complicated for many of us. Good morning, friends, and good morning uh, to, to the ex uh, colleagues who are here at Howard, uh, my good friend Howard, Marie Richard Jenny, Charles Gear, that I have to say. There he is. Uh, good morning to all of you as well. Um, the wheels of progress on issues of fairness and equity is always incredibly, olympi olympically, very, very slow. And it shouldn't be that way, but that is the reality that people with disabilities uh, face. And we need to continue to fight back. As I look at the history of what we have done, at least in my time, uh, 24 years in the legislature, we, in 1990, had uh, introduced, uh, a bit later than that, employment equity legislation. And I have to tell you, it was difficult. And we faced a great deal of resistance as we did that in our communities. But we went through it, and we passed it. And it didn't take long for the next government to repeal that legislation. Within three months, it was gone. And then with the pressure from people with disabilities, the next government introduced an ODA, a weak one, but they introduced one. And then the next one introduced a better one, an AODA. And it was a better thing uh, that, that, that we needed, that we expected. And it wasn't the best. And I recall arguing that, with it, that if, if we have to wait for accessibility for 20 years, many of us will be dead and gone. I remember saying that. Why does it take so long? But it does take long. And the point of it is, that we have good governments and we have great individual members that sometimes do the right thing and push that elephant of progress. But it's never enough. But the real heroes, the ones who make governments accountable, the ones who force governments from time to time to do the right thing, is all of you. And David mentioned Gary as one of those great uh, members who uh, began that wheel of progress to, to take place. And then the coalition began its work to force governments and individual members to do the right thing. But you cannot wait for either individual members or governments to do the right thing. You are the ones who have to continue to push that wheel of progress. We cannot rely on anyone else. And as we do that, and if we never let up, Progress will happen. You just have to keep pushing hard. Because that's what we got to do. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. So, let me tell you how history.
history unfolded. The spring election came in 1995. The first political leader to promise a Disabilities Act was the then Liberal leader, Lynn McLeod. Trying to rival her, her offering, the second political leader to promise on behalf of their party a Disabilities Act was Conservative leader Mike Harris. He promised the Disabilities Act in his first term and he promised to work with us uh, to develop it. Over the next years after he won the election, his government was, let's say gently, a little bit slow to pick up that promise. And yet, we worked with one MPP after another across the board, we're nonpartisan, to try to make progress. We were helped by both opposition NDP and liberals. In, two, in 1996, Marion Boyd, then an opposition New Democratic member, she wasn't able to make it today, but we honor her, introduced a resolution that passed on the vote of all parties, calling on the government to keep its promise of a Disabilities Act. In 1998, two more years later, a liberal MPP by the name of Dwight Duncan, who unfortunately was unable to make it today as well, but we honor him, uh, introduced a, another resolution at our request, a second resolution. It listed 11 principles that a Disability Act must comply with. It was, these were the 11 principles that we had written and that Dwight had convinced the Liberal Party to accept. That resolution passed on October 29, 1998, and it passed unanimously. There are a couple of things that are amazing about that day. First, it was perhaps one of the most important days in the first decade of our history. Uh, second, it became the yardstick by which all disability legislation and all progress would be, and today still is, measured. Third, right after the resolution passed, I walked into the Queen's Park Media Studio with then opposition leader Dalton McGinty, and in front of all, he publicly said that if elected, he would honor that resolution. That was the first public promise by a political leader that went that far. And finally, not one single word appeared in any media that day about this landmark event. We learn from that never to be deterred by the fact that the media on occasion don't cover us. They have too much to cover. We have to just keep working to try to earn whatever coverage we can. A couple of, a month later, on the 23rd of November, 1998, then conservative citizenship minister Isabel Bassett introduced her government's first proposed Disabilities Act. This is the first bill since Gary's. It was only three pages long. It didn't require a single barrier to be removed or prevented, ever. With opposition criticism, thanks to people like Dwight Duncan, and people like Mary Boyd, and NDP critic uh, Francis Lincoln, who also was under the weather and couldn't make it today, and we honor her. For though, with their pressure, the government let that bill die on the order paper. It never even got to second reading. The Conservatives won again in 1999. The opposition kept up the pressure. We are indebted and honor Liberal MPP Steve Peters, who wanted to be here today but wasn't able to, and Ernie Parsons, who were the liberal critics, who added their voice. Steve toured the province of Ontario and held shadow hearings, hearing from people like you, all over Ontario in February of 2000. Not the best time to travel. As well, he introduced a resolution, that, a third resolution that got all parties support on the 23rd of November, 1999, saying a Disabilities Act must be passed within two years. Well, then things change. A fourth citizenship minister was appointed under the Conservative government, and I would say in retrospect, the first who took this issue seriously. Cam Jackson took on this role. Is Cam here, by the way? He was going to be coming, but I don't know if he was able to make it. Is Cam here? I don't know. Oh. He comes in, let me know. He was going to try to be here. But let me just tell you, I drove Kim nuts. 
And he drove me nuts. But it was out of mutual respect. And our coalition drove his government nuts and vice versa. But what Cam did, to his credit, is he went out and actually talked to people with disabilities around the province. He was the first minister of his government to do so. And then he went back and to his credit, he wrote a bill which was the best bill he could get from his government. It wasn't strong enough, it wasn't good enough, the opposition commendably voted against it, and it passed in December of, 19, of 2001. It was the last law ever enacted when Mike Harris was Premier. The opposition proposed amendment after amendment at our request, when people like you came to hearings to demand more. Those amendments were defeated. So on the one hand, we were improperly were critical that the bill didn't go far enough, but on the other hand, we got a bill and we got the, the, the process started to go from a weaker bill to a stronger bill. And further to Cam's credit, once the Liberals took power in 2003, uh, he actually got up in the House and conceded that his own bill didn't go far enough. And indeed argued that the Liberal bill should go further. So we honor Cam Jackson, if he comes later, we'll give him a chance to microphone. But in any event, let me then take you to the uh, important year of 2003. 2003, the voters went to the polls. We turned to all three political parties to ask them to commit to a stronger Disabilities Act. One that was mandatory, not the Conservative Voluntary Bill. One that applied to all sectors, the Conservative one only applied to the public sector. One that would be effectively enforced. The Conservative Bill had virtually no enforcement at all. By the way, if any of you are a member of an Accessibility Advisory Committee, Cam Jackson, one of the things he slipped into his bill was a requirement that all municipalities with 10,000 or more people had to have one of those committees. Some already did, many didn't. But this actually built the infrastructure for us to get a lot of grassroots supports over the, de over the decade uh, that has followed. But what happened in the 2003 election, like the 1999 election, is the two political leaders promised the Disabilities Act if elected, and one that would meet our 11 principles. One was Dalton McGinty, who couldn't be here today, and the other is a gentleman named Howard Hampton. I'd like to ask Howard to come up, and we'd like to honor him for having put his party behind our issue, behind our principles, and having fought at every opportunity to get whatever accessibility measures were raised strengthened and toughened up. Howard, could you come up, please? or a badge or a, uh, a medal, we're giving you a ball cap. If you trust me that what it says in Braille is make a difference, because you did. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Uh, uh, where I come from, uh, two might be better. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I could make a baseball cap. But, uh, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to see so many people here who, uh, if you'll permit me to use the expressions, have been hanging around the halls of Queen's Park for many, many years. And I know that many of you have. Um, I, uh, oh, I just want to uh, speak a bit about history, because some of this is history. And, and I just want to make one correction as, as uh, it applies to Gary Markowski. Uh, it is true that Gary may not have had a cabinet position, but let me tell you, Gary was always all over the cabinet. <laughs> if you stepped outside the cabinet room to get a sandwich, Gary would be there. If you uh, stepped outside to do a media scrum, Gary would be there. And if you dared to try to go to the bathroom, Gary would be there. Uh, and and I, I say that uh, only half in jest. Because that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Uh, it, it takes that kind of uh, energy and commitment. And I can tell you, because uh, Gary and I uh, uh, still sometimes uh, see each other 
at the, at the soccer pitch uh, or at, on the baseball diamond, uh, that uh, he's still doing that. That he, uh, he hasn't stopped and he says he's getting a bit older. I would say <clears throat> he's getting a bit wiser, uh, not older. He's, he's uh, become more committed than ever. Let me just say a few words uh, about David. Uh, I have the unique pleasure of knowing David not only from this association, but uh, as Attorney General, I actually got to, got to tell him what to do once in a while. Yeah. I, I didn't listen. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the second part. He didn't listen very well. Uh, but uh, I, I got to see the, uh, the integrity and the energy and the commitment that David brings to his work all the time. And I don't think this coalition would exist today uh, without his incredible energy, his commitment, and his willingness to second what some other folks have already said. Um, these struggles are not easy. They're not. Uh, and, and you have to work at them all the time. And you have to be finding uh, new people to work with you all the time. The fact of the matter is we live in a world uh, where there's a great deal of inequality. In fact, I would say we're living in a world where inequality is growing on an almost daily basis, which requires then you have to dig deep and you have to find new ways, new avenues, new energy, and new people to continue the struggle. It's one thing to have legislation. It's another thing to have the resources to implement it. It's another thing to have the resources to enforce it. And then it's yet another thing to keep pace with the changes that are happening in society. Just one example. It's an example because, because of some of the work my, my wife, who's also a former member and wanted to be here today, but she couldn't get time off from work, uh, that, that she's very close to. 20 years ago, uh, children struggling with autism was not an issue that was talked about very often. It is today, but now the challenge that society faces is adults. Adults. And adults living in society who have to deal with the issues of autism. So it, it's, it's not like time stands still. The challenges grow, the challenges change, the challenges diversify. And you have to do the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. In 2003, the Liberals were elected. The Premier, uh, Premier McGinty appointed Marie Boutriani to be the minister responsible to develop a Disabilities Act. She showed that the government can move decisively, boldly, and quickly. To all those here from the government or who may be listening in, who think that the government needs to take forever to decide anything on accessibility, look at Marie Boutriani. Within one year, she consulted with the community right across the province, held stakeholder meetings with us, business, and the broader public sector. She got a bill introduced, and she got it endorsed by us and the Chamber of Commerce. Go figure. <laughs> Things can be done. I'd like to introduce to you the architect of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Please accept your ball cap, Marie, Dr. Marie Boutriani. Said to me, Marie, you should have a press release today. I said, 
why? It's just a meeting. He said, it's the first time they've ever gotten together. And I thought, wow. It doesn't make sense for people that have to work something out to be in the same room. And of course, by the end of the meeting, there was so much agreement that the chamber at the end and all the other businesses did sign off on, on the bill. There was one gentleman in that room from Hamilton, who was an executive, who said this, Minister, as a businessman, you're scaring me. But as a father of a disabled girl, you're not moving fast enough. And that summarized our challenge. And I do remember going from city to city, from town to town, and listening to the stories and the heartbreaks, and remembering uh, a sick feeling in my stomach. Why am I feeling sick? And I remembered, and I'm a psychologist, so I analyze everything. <laughs> that when I was a student at the University of Waterloo, when I started out in engineering, there were certain internships that were unavailable to young women students because there weren't washrooms in those industries. And when asked why, we were told, there aren't enough women coming through our building for it to be worth the expense. Can you imagine our daughters being told that today? And that was my mantra across the province. That was what I think made a paradigm shift in some people's minds. I know the journey is far from over. I, 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 I understand that. But I think besides law being hard, any government and any party, we have to do our part. And as dean of the Chang School, I'm very proud to say we have an AODA certificate. We just hired someone to make sure that all our technology online courses are accessible. I thought, it would be pretty embarrassing if a former minister of the AODA didn't have that. <laughs> and the Wright and Ryerson University is, I think, the only university that has in Ontario that has a degree in disability studies. So we're, let's try and walk the talk, all of us, in our small way and lobby in a big way. And thank you, and I will wear this uh, cap with pride. Thank you very much. Credit also has to go to Dalton McGinty. Dalton took power, had an agenda, and we were on it. And he instructed his minister to go bold. He gave us a strong minister, and we got legislation that didn't include everything we wanted, but which included a key, key requirements. It required accessibility to be achieved by 2025, and it obligated the government not to pay for it, but to lead us there, to pass and enforce all the accessibility standards that were needed to ensure full accessibility was achieved. He got that law passed, and he got that law passed unanimously with the able work of Marie Butriani. So I wanted, Dalton wasn't able to make it here today, but I'm going to ask the head air traffic controller of all the volunteers who helped you find your way in. AODA supporter Emily Lucen, second year law student at Osmond Hall, to come up and read an email that I got from Dalton that he wanted uh, read to you. Dear David, please allow me to congratulate and thank you and all the AODA Alliance gang for your hard work, leadership, and inspiration over so many years. It was my honor to have led an opposition party and then a government that took steps to fully embrace Ontarians with disabilities by making our promise truly accessible to them. We can all take pride in having come a long way, but we must also look to the future with renewed purpose and an unrelenting commitment to achieve our goal, an Ontario that is barrier-free to family, friends, and neighbours with a disability. I say that I led my party and government in taking steps forward, but in truth, I was following you, David, and so many other Ontarians with disabilities who inspired me through my courage and determination. I am grateful for your leadership and I wish you continued success. Dalton. So the law took uh, action and we got to get to work. We've gotten some gains. They passed accessibility standards in five areas, in the areas of customer service, transportation, employment, information, communication, and built environment in a limited range of public spaces. But it's not enough 
and it's not going fast enough. One of the brilliant features built into this law by uh, Dr. Mutriani was a requirement that the government not simply coast, but appoint someone independent, an independent individual, to review progress, take our temperature, and let us know what more needs to be done. In 2009, the government appointed Charles Beer to conduct that review. Charles is a former cabinet minister from the Peterson government and has a heart of gold. Charles listened to us, listened to the disability community, listened to the business community, and rendered a strong report in 2010 that politely, Charles is polite to a fault, gently, Charles knows how to pack a punch with the gently worded words, with a lot of, uh, of, uh, a lot of punch behind them, told the government that they need to get off their backsides and do a heck of a lot more. We want to honor Charles Beer for his work independently reviewing the government's work, candidly telling them what to do, and providing us and the public with a roadmap if only the government were to follow it. Charles Beer. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, <laughs> together with uh, uh, former uh, colleagues who are here, I'm, I'm delighted and, and honored to have been invited. Uh, and I think the, the message that I would bring, uh, as others have uh, before, um, is how important it is that uh, legislatures, that individuals, uh, <clears throat> people do important things. But one recognizes, and certainly I did in, uh, in carrying out the review in 2009-2010, that, uh, that, that individuals, governments can waver. It's not that they are giving up on the, the principles, or it's not that they don't want to do things, but so many actions have a moment in time where there's a tremendous amount of energy, and the difficulty is always how do we keep that going? And one of the ways that it keeps on going, quite frankly, is when there are people like David, people like yourselves, uh, who uh, are always, uh, <clears throat> as was noted about Gary and Malkowski, uh, in, in our face. Uh, th that has to be part of the way uh, things work. We have to be reminded uh, of the, the, the principles, uh, the, the actions that, uh, that, that we need to take. Uh, and so I look on uh, so much good that has been done uh, through the course of, uh, of the, the 20 years of the, the Alliance, uh, through the course of a actions and activities from all governments, uh, but just recognize that while much has been done, uh, much remains to be done. And, and we all need to be committed to that. And if I would have a message uh, uh, today, it is that for all governments, you need to make this a critical issue. It has to be given uh, the leadership that, that is required. You have to be out there talking to the people in the province about how important uh, these issues are, not just for those with disabilities, but for all of us. So thank you very much. Today. Thank you very much. Well, working by the way, for those who don't know, the, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee, which started 20 years ago, wound up in 2005 when Murray's bill was passed, because our mandate was to get a bill, and a good one. What's happened since then is we reformed as the AODA Alliance and picked up the same people and the same strategies to get the law effectively enforced. Well, politicians can do an important part, but we also need public servants. The government has within the ministry responsible for this legislation an office called the Accessibility Directorate. They don't get a lot of public credit, but they work very hard. And I will tell you that having worked with them, they are people who are really dedicated, really trying to do the best. If only their political masters would give them the scope they need. And we want to honor, is Ellen here today? Ellen Marks, she said she wasn't going to be able to make it because she's, everybody's sick. We won't event they get sick. But Ellen Waxman was the Assistant Deputy uh, Minister of Community and Social Services from 2008 to 2013, steered some of the major accessibility standards through, was a tough negotiator, believe me, I know, but did a really effective job in the highest traditions of a good public servant. 
and we honor her here today. Let me now turn to one more individual in public office, and then we're going to talk about the media for just a couple of minutes. David Onley. What little do I need to say about David Onley? What a fabulous individual. He took the role of Lieutenant <coughs> Governor from 2007 to just a few weeks ago and dedicated it to the issue of accessibility. David, by his very presence, by his wheelchair and by the force of his spirit and his words, tore down barriers anywhere in his path. Because if you wanted David to speak at your event, he better be accessible. <laughs> he put the issue on the map like no other Lieutenant Governor had before. Let me invite up to honor David Onley. He gave people of the Order of Ontario, medals, and all sorts of things. We're going to give them a ball cap. <laughs>
I have often likened this process to being like in a relay race. Each and every one of us has our own special area of responsibility, whether as a, as a lawyer and as an advocate, whether it's as a media fellow and then as, a, as the lieutenant governor, or whatever the respective capacities have been. It's like a relay race. We just keep passing the torch on to the next person. But those of us with disabilities and who are committed to this cause have to take it a step further. We don't just hand it off to one person and then stop running ourselves. We have to carry a lot of torches, and we have to distribute those torches. And so I would just ask each and every one of you to keep doing what you've been doing. I am so honored to be here today, David, and to be with the fellow honorees that I won't take the time to mention right now, but I'm looking at. Uh, and thank you for your contributions uh, to making this a much, much better place. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Is it possible for us to sort of squeeze the people who are in room 230 in this room by understanding or one way or another? How many, how many have we got in room 230? Okay, so come on in. Um, well, by the way, I'm going to up you one day. I'm going to take the ante and I'm going to raise it. Because frankly, everybody has a disability or gets one eventually. So actually, we're not just the majority. Folks, we're everyone. And no politician, no political party can afford to alienate everyone. The, uh, I want to talk just for a couple of minutes before we wind up about the media. The media are not our allies. They are not our friends. They are an independent branch of our society who cover issues. They do their job professionally, they do their job objectively. We don't expect favoritism, and we don't ask for favors. But we do ask for an opportunity to be heard. When we started on this issue, just like most politicians have never heard of us, most journalists have. The world has changed, thanks to your efforts across this province, raising one barrier at a time with your local media. But there are particular journalists, or former journalists, who are news organizations who've made a huge difference. I want to honor three of them. We want to honor three of them right now. Uh, we may only have an opportunity for one to speak because of time. From CBC, the former journalist, uh, host of Metro Morning, Andy Berry. Andy, is Andy here? But we honor him who has covered our issue from the beginning, from the beginning, both at CBC and before at CFRB. We want to thank the Toronto Star's editorial side. Their editorial side, while the new side covers our issues and we're indebted, we want to single out their editorial side. And we do so because Journalists who cover stories, they cover the news, and that's really important. And those who identify us as news, we appreciate that, we encourage that. But when a newspaper has the courage to stand up editorially and say, we're right and the government's wrong, time and again on our issue, we deserve, or they deserve, our honor and our recognition. And the Toronto Star has been, bar none, the newspaper that has editorially supported us since the toughest days of the 1990s, right up to the present, time and again editorially. We want to thank them. Is Bob Hepburn here? I don't know if Bob is here. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Hepburn. Yeah. He's just, uh, looks like, it sounds like it has the same name as the guy who wrote that fabulous column in the story yesterday. <laughs> Uh, please take your ball cap and thank you so much for your editorial support for us through that. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a great honor on behalf of all the people at the Toronto Star. Um, more than 100 years.
years, we've covered the issues that affect everyone in our communities. Uh, the Star has had journalists uh, assigned to cover dis disabled uh, issues as part of their mandates. Uh, Helen Henderson in the past, uh, Barbara Turnbull. This is a tradition that we will continue. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Andy Berry represents radio, and Bob Hepburn and the Star represents the print media. Let's talk about TV for a moment. And uh, there is no public affairs program that has been more fair, even-handed, and open to our issues than the agenda with Steve Paper. Steve has had, and, and his fabulous staff, have been open to consider our issues, but they do it on one condition, which is, as it properly should be, no holds barred. They ask, Steve asks the tough questions, what's it going to cost, how can we do this in this kind of economy, the questions that deserve to be asked and that we are happy and proud to answer. Not only that, but Steve just doesn't ask those questions of us, he asks questions about these issues to the politicians who come on his program as well. More so than any journalist I have seen, he's been prepared on a, on a public affairs uh, TV program to kind of to broach these issues and to explore them in a serious, intensive, and fair way. Steve Payton. David, uh, I've had the great joy in doing my job of talking to literally tens of thousands of people over 30 years, 22 of them in TVO, and I cannot think of an advocate for a cause who is more indefatigable than you. <laughs> you are amazing. tried this before I came in here today, but I didn't. If you go into the dictionary and look up the word indefatigable, I bet you a picture there. <laughs> I'm not sure what I bet it is. Uh, you've been good enough to come on TVO every time we've invited you to come on. You wear that Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario brilliantly, and you've earned it for all of the great work you've done over the years. Et si je peux en français pour mes amis à Radio Canada, je suis très heureux pour vous. Je suis très fier de vos efforts. Vous avez fait une grande différence dans les vies des Ontariens et des Ontariennes. Bravo, David, et bonne chance avec vos efforts de continuer la bataille. Good luck with your efforts to continue the battle. Thank you. Very much. Well, let's conclude by talking not about the past, but about the future. Our strength comes from the people like you around this province, whether you've been advocating for 20 years or for 20 minutes. Every one of you is the strength that drives us forward. Let me take the temperature of the government for the moment in a nonpartisan and I hope a fair way. I think the government really would like to do well on this issue, but I think the government is a little rudderless right now. They've made a lot of good promises, and I genuinely think they meant them. But they're not keeping a good many of them, if not most, on accessibility. This came to the most clear uh, focus about a month ago, when the Premier, to her credit, released her mandate letters giving marching orders to every single minister on every issue that she wanted to identify as a priority. Premiers do that, but they never made them public before. This openness and transparency, which is commendable, let us take a close look. And what we found out was that many, if not most, of the commitments and obligations that the government has for us were left out systematically. It can't be a coincidence. I don't believe in that much coincidence. We worried that this might happen, so we asked the party leaders last spring, during the election, to promise that if elected, they would direct their uh, ministers to keep their commitments to us. 
the mandate letters were a great opportunity, the most obvious place. We have a lot to do. So what's wrong? What do you think's wrong? Here's my diagnosis, and the AODA Alliance wants to offer a solution. The diagnosis is, it's been 20 years since we first fought one MPP at a time to build support for this movement. Most of those MPPs are no longer in the legislature. In fact, if you look at the cabinet today, and by the way, that's for all parties, but if you look at the cabinet today, a number of them were not in the, in the, in the legislature when we were fighting to get our, 18, our 11 principles approved in 1998. A number of them weren't even in the legislature when it unanimously voted for the Disabilities Act that Marie Boutriani wrote in 2005. In other words, to them, this law is not the product of a grassroots struggle over a decade from 1994 to 2005, for them, it's just one of 750 laws. What's your problem? We got lots to do, it's just another one. Well folks, it's not just another one. It's an important one. It's one that we fought for and the one that we want to see effectively implemented. The Premier promised us in writing when she ran for leadership of her party that Ontario, she would ensure that we are on schedule for full accessibility by 2025. Well, we're not. And the government doesn't have a public plan to get us there. We do. We made it available last summer and we wrote every minister with responsibility to tell them what should be on their plate. Kind of like our mandate letters. Well, how do we rebuild that support? We've got to realize that most, many if not most of these MPPs weren't there for this fight and their political advisors weren't. So we've got to go back 20 years, folks, and do what we did so well. We've got to start building support one MPP at a time. And we need you to do that. Whether it's a liberal, NDP, or conservative, make an appointment to meet them. Talk to their policy advisors. Tell them about the barriers you face. We today will unveil a comprehensive strategy. We'll roll out the details over the next weeks to work one MPP at a time to rebuild the momentum that we had 20 years ago, or that we started building 20 years ago, and that seems to be lost at Queen's Park. But we need you to do that. We'll give you the tools, we'll provide an action kit, we'll give you ideas of what to say, we'll even let you know the list of names and addresses of MPPs that will all be coming in the next weeks. And be ready to be creative. Let's use tools we didn't have 20 years ago. We didn't have Twitter, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have YouTube. Take out your smartphone, when you see a barrier, take a picture or record a video. If you've got a guide dog and you go into a restaurant, they won't let you in, take out your iPhone, even if you're blind, tap, double tap that camera button, set video, point it at this poor person who's not letting you in, and say, I'm blind, I'm at this restaurant, so and so date, Say your name for my camera and just tell me why you won't let me and my seeing eye go. <laughs> With your support, we can do it. Let me end where we began today. 20 years ago, tomorrow, when those 20 people went in the room, what they wanted to achieve would seem objectively impossible. We weren't deterred. We carried on. Those still with us today, those like my friends Carol Reback and, uh, and Don Ogner and Michael Lewis and Kathy Watts and so many others who fought with us and were no longer alive and to whom we're indebted. We carried on. We didn't care if it looked uphill. It may look uphill to achieve full accessibility when we've only got 10 years left and to get a government to keep promises when they keep ignoring them. But that's nowhere near as daunting as what we faced 20 years ago. Look where we've come so far. We're not daunted. Let's continue. Thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to getting a chance to chat in the morning.